Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the final session of PA today. Uh, and welcome to this elective in particular. Uh, by now, hopefully, you've found your way around on the website. Uh, if you haven't, there is an outline for this talk on the website, and you can go and download that if you just go back uh, to the main page. Uh, we'll still be here when you get back here and uh, hit to download the outline. That may be helpful for you uh, over the next hour or so. Uh, the Slido reference number for this session is C for Charlie 812. C for Charlie 812. Uh, be great to have your questions and interaction and after about an hour or so, we'll dive into that for the last half hour of our time together. Let me introduce myself, uh, the topic, and then our speaker. My name's Simon Gillam. Uh, I've been here at Moore College for about five years now, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be chairing this session. This is an important uh, session, and I'm, I'm conscious as we begin um, that whenever we talk about domestic violence, we can't help but have an emotional weight attached to that because all of our uh, experiences and backgrounds are different and some of us have been uh, very significantly affected uh, by this as a topic. And so before we get to the topic, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray uh, specifically uh, for Andrew. Uh, Dr Andrew Leslie will be uh, leading us to think biblically about uh, sin and the impact of sin in our experience of domestic violence, our understanding of domestic violence. Uh, but I want to pray for our hearts as we listen as well, that we might hear God speak through his word as we contemplate these things. So let's begin our time by praying. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to think about what is a painful reality in a broken world. And we pray your blessing on our next hour and a half together and we pray, Father, that everything that's done and said here would be for your glory and for the building up of your church. And we pray particularly, Lord, that as we uh, listen carefully to what your word says about the nature of sin, that we might better love people who are in the midst of domestic violence or who have suffered in the past in domestic violence. And we pray, Father... Uh, that for us and for them, this would be a wonderfully productive time. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessing on Andrew, pray that you give him clarity of thought and speech, and we pray, Father, uh, that together we might hear you speak through your word, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, please welcome Dr Andrew Leslie. Thank you, Simon, and uh, let me reiterate my welcome to those of you who've joined us on the live stream. Um, uh, it's my um, privilege to be uh, addressing this particular topic, a very difficult topic, uh, as Simon has um, indicated already and it really goes without saying. And I want to say um, just at the outset of this seminar um, that obviously this is something that needs to be handled with a very great deal of care and the potential for causing hurt is acute, um, even unintentionally, as was apparent to me in the, uh, the wording of the initial advertisement to this seminar. And I take full responsibility for that error of judgment, and as I hope will become clear as we go, I'm intending to make a different point, a very different point from the way in which the words might have been understood. Nonetheless, I should have foreseen that the wording could have been potentially very misleading in a very serious way and I'm once again I do want to apologise for that unreservedly. I don't want to be misunderstood, no one wants to be misunderstood, but far more significant to me uh, is the potentially distressing and damaging effect of ambiguous or misleading language on those who have been tragically violated by the abuse of others. The words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 have been echoing in my ears as I prepared this session, especially Paul's admonition to encourage the disheartened. Uh, now, while this seminar is not directly for survivors of domestic violence, but for those who have some pastoral ministry, uh, 
uh, to support them. I am sincerely hoping that the content of this session will only end up serving their joy and healing. And I say that conscious of the fact that there may well be a number here uh, on the live stream who have been touched directly by this issue, as I myself have. So let me say at the outset that I and the p &A Centre and Moore College unequivocally condemn acts of violence and patterns of domestic abuse as things which are utterly reprehensible and never to be condoned or justified in any way. Absolutely everything needs to be done within our powers to aid the prevention of violence in the first place, uh, but where violence has taken place to ensure the protections of victims of abuse to listen and to support them in their healing. And please let me also reiterate that this session was never intending to and will not be suggesting that victims of abuse are in any way complicit, responsible or guilty for the acts that have been perpetrated against them. No, I have something very different in mind. And it's to suggest that when understood from a theological perspective, domestic violence, like all forms of human oppression needs to be set in the context of a doctrine of sin and specifically the fall and the effects of the fall on the entire human race. And understanding it that way will not subtract from anything that has been said so far about the inexcusable character of abuse, the innocence as well as the protection and support of victims. And nor will it subtract from any of the accepted definitions of what constitutes specific patterns of domestic violence and the specialist guidelines for the way that that should be responded to in a church setting. All of that must be assumed and must be practiced by pastoral workers in dialogue with professionals and therapists. And if not, then we have very, very clearly failed in our duty of care. I'm not a professional and I can't give professional wisdom and I don't really want to say uh, to intrude onto a space or into a space where I have no expertise. And nor am I on the front line of pastoral ministry and I don't pretend here to give specific instruction on the proper pastoral response. Each case is unique obviously and requires very specific wisdom. And I trust that your own church or ministry organisation will have specific policies and guidelines which need to be carefully applied and of course there are important resources available to you and I, I'm referring now to the, the first point on the outline that I hope that you ha are able to have in front of you. Uh, the, uh, I'll just see if I can find the next slide as well. Like the Sydney Diocesan Domestic Abuse Policy uh, that's a, a place to start, really. That's a very important, good practice guidelines. There are resources available like the No Domestic Abuse course uh, on the Safe Ministry Training website for those of you who are in Anglican ministry in Sydney. And then there are, of course, a, a, a panoply of books that have been written on this subject, and I just mentioned one that's very recently appeared by Darby Strickland, Is It Abuse? A Biblical Guide to... Uh, to domestic abuse and helping victims um, coming from the perspective of the biblical counselling movement uh, in America. So there's a number of resources. That's not ex by any means an exhaustive list of resources and they are very important. But my intention today really as a theologian of sorts <laughs> or at least someone who gets paid to think theologically about things and as someone with a keen interest in the formation of pastors, I feel like I have a responsibility to speak to this tragic reality. Of course, to be able to do it in a context like this is a privilege, especially where a great many survivors don't feel like they have the freedom to speak up at all. To be able to speak into this space is an enormous privilege that all pastors have, in fact, and I'm sure that you'll agree that um, that the last thing that we want to do and the last thing that any of us want to do is to speak presumptuously or out of turn. And I can only ask for your forgiveness if I do. In this session, I'm not at all pretending to address the structural or cultural issues within the church or wider society that have contributed to the neglect of this issue or even fostered a climate that has perpetuated domestic violence. And to that extent, 
you might find that what I have to say is rather unsatisfactory. Now that's an important conversation that we need to continue to have. All I simply want to do is to add a theological dimension to our understanding of abuse, which it seems to me can be easily neglected, but which is absolutely vital. And by the way, I'm exceedingly grateful uh, to the one or two who have offered very helpful feedback on this material, and I won't mention their names lest they get implicated in any of the inadequacies of what <laughs> I have to say. But their input has undoubtedly made this a much, much better seminar than it would have been otherwise. So I'm really very grateful to them. Now let me just summarise the main point um, and then we're going to unfold and unpack it. In short, I want to say that domestic violence, like all forms of oppression, needs to be understood as an evil system which takes on a life of its own beyond discrete acts and abusive behaviour in a way that distorts and disfigures the one who uses violence, as well as creating a tremendous burden that violates the agency of its survivors and threatens to do so in an ongoing fashion. And therefore, from a Christian perspective, it's very important to recognise the way in which God is inviting victims to an alertness, to a kind of active awareness of the way in which this evil has burdened them and how it threatens to violate them in an ongoing way. But it's a kind of alertness and a kind of awareness which is set within the context of God's promise that he alone will bring true justice as well as his gracious invitation to carry those burdens himself. And I want to suggest that this recognition is vital for the survivor and in an analogous but very different way for the abuser too, although most of what I will be saying will be attending to the impact of this reality on the victim. Very important, however, lest the evil that has been unleashed continue to torment and assault those directly involved, even when the specific acts or patterns of behaviour might have receded into the past. And to my mind, an awareness of this reality is critical for those of us in pastoral ministry who witness abuse and who seek to exercise our very privileged duty of care to those uh, of support to those who have suffered abuse. And not only will it shape the way that we care for survivors, but it also calls for a certain awareness of how we too might be caught up in this dynamic and run the risk of perpetuating it in its own way. And that will, I think, become apparent as I go. Now, I wondered how to proceed to defend this claim without it immediately engendering any misunderstanding. And in the end, I felt it was safest and best um, to go to first to scripture to illustrate the general point before unfolding the theological connection to the fall towards the end. And I landed upon a psalm a psalm of David. I know that of all biblical figures, you may think that, uh, you know, to speak about his experience of violence, you might think that David himself was on rather shaky ground as one who, as you well know, used his considerable power and privilege so treacherously against Bathsheba uh, with, and, uh, uh, and, and her husband Uriah. But he too was the victim of oppression and being God's anointed king, yes, it gave him unique power and status, but in other ways it made him a particular target of oppression, as many of the Psalms within the Psalter readily attest. I mean, there was a time when Christians would instinctively turn to the Psalter as a way of finding clarity about and giving voice to our experience of God's as God's people in a broken world while we wait for the coming of Christ and the new age. And I think it's to our detriment that our familiarity with the Psalter isn't what it once was. One of the Psalms that is rawest about David's own experience of violence is Psalm 55. I've printed it on the outline uh, so, you, uh, so you can easily refer to it as we go. I won't read it because it's a longish Psalm. Um, you, well, you might be able to dial it up on your device, um, but I will be referring to it and mentioning various verses. So please um, have that open before you if you can. Um, as I say, some of, the, some of this is a prayer um, of David that's addressed to God. Some of it is a kind of a, 
soliloquy as David thinks aloud about his own experience. Some of it perhaps is written to uh, an intended audience. I'm not going to offer a, an exposition of it, but I want to draw out some implications that I think are pertinent to this topic. See, David is bearing his soul before God. There's, there's an enemy or enemies who have assaulted him uh, in some way. So verse 3 or verse 9, verse 15, verse 23. We don't know much about exactly what David has in mind, but one of the most striking things is that amongst them is a friend, someone very close to him indeed, verse 13 with whom he once enjoyed sweet fellowship, a companion who has violated his covenant with those close to him, verse 20. We don't know much about the betrayal or the specific form of abuse either, except to say that we know that it involves words, verse 3, verse 9, threats, verse 3, abuse, verse 12, lies, verse 11, insults, Verse 12, duplicity, manipulation. They are the sort who speak with a forked tongue. Verse 21, his talk is as smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, and yet they are drawn swords. But take note of the effect that it has had on David. There's a tone of desperation from the outset. He pleads with God, verse 1. He is so distressed by what has been done to him that it is messing with his head. My thoughts trouble me, verse 2. They assail me with their anger and they bring down suffering on me, verse 3. Notice that, a burden that has been dumped on him like a great big millstone. There is anguish, verse 4. There is fear, not just of the enemy or the specific act of aggression necessarily, but of something bigger. I mean, who knows if David's life was actually at risk. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But now there is a terror of death, another burden that has overwhelmed him. Fear, trembling, horror, which have beset him like some insidious disease with no immediate or obvious cure or relief. So much so that the only consolation he can find is to dream of a happy place, verse 6. Oh, if I could fly away like a bird to the wilderness, to a place of solace or rest and somehow escape it all. There is the particular grief of betrayal by someone close to him, verse 12. A grief which is particularly unendurable in a way that it wouldn't be for anyone else, he says. And that's just all the stuff that's obviously on the surface. Um, but don't forget that this was Israel's king. He was the one who was supposed to protect the city from its enemies, to be victorious against its foes, to be an agent of peace and protection. And yet there's only insurrection as far as his eyes can see. There is violence and strife in the city, verse 9. Day and night the wicked prowl about on its walls, verse 10. Its streets are overrun with destructive forces, with threats and lies. So could it be then that part of the way in which this is messing with his head is through the sense that in some way he has let the side down, that he has failed in his duty and that maybe all this sordid business is his fault? I mean, on the one hand, David knows he is innocent and his oppressors are absolutely guilty for all that they have done to him. And objectively, that is entirely true. There's no question about that. And, and David may not have failed in his kingly duty in any way. He may well have been, done absolutely everything that he could. That may not be in question at all, necessarily. But could it be that the fear that he has failed in some way is part and parcel of the suffering he bears? The shame of feeling that he has lost control of his command. It's sort of slightly reading between the lines, but it's not an unreasonable inference to draw. David hasn't failed in any way necessarily, but maybe the fear that he has, which is quite a different thing, is part and parcel of the suffering he is enduring. 
Now, the point that I want to draw out here is more subtle than to say that the psalm is realistic and honest about the extensively damaging effects of interpersonal violence, although obviously it is. And nor is it to say that David's experience of violence, his own experience here, is somehow representative of anyone else's experience of violence. There'll be points at which it might overlap, points at which it doesn't. What I do want to point out is how the destruction that has been unleashed is clearly greater than the sum total of any specific acts of aggression. The violence has seemingly taken on a life of its own. It's become a kind of a dynamic force. See how he talks about it there in verse 11? It's an evil burden, an almost perpetual tempest that wages war on David's soul, that messes with his head, that triggers innumerable fears and quite possibly induces a sense of shame. And not only is it a force that's taken hold of him, it's a force that has taken hold of his oppressors too, albeit with very different consequences. Verse 15, evil finds lodging, a home among them. But from David's perspective or the perspective of the victim, it's a force that continues to torment and threatens to crush him in a way that is bigger than any specific act or deed. There is an enemy, in other words, that is larger than the agents who have set loose its destructive artillery, even though those agents remain entirely accountable for their wicked deeds. The fact that the damaging effects of violence transcend the violent deeds, as well as perhaps the intentions of the abuser, doesn't in any way take away from the accountability of the oppressor, as if they can somehow excuse them by saying some evil force made me do it. No, not at all. Moreover, the fact that these damaging effects transcend violent deeds doesn't mean they sort of dissolve into a kind of amorphous evil of the most general sort either. No, they remain recognisably connected to the particular kind of violence that has occurred, albeit now having taken on a life of its own. An enemy has been unleashed. And it's an enemy to David's wholeness and well-being. It has alienated him from what is good. It has robbed him of joy. And to the extent that it has disrupted the peace, the shalom that he might experience, even in the goodness of God, it's affected his relationship with God. Because instead of the goodness of God, right now something else is screaming a whole lot louder. Where is the goodness of God in all this? That sense of protest, of complaint, is perhaps more explicit in other psalms, but it's subtly present even here in its opening lines. Don't ignore me, Lord, because right now it jolly well feels like you are. There is a cloud, you see, that is blocking the sunlight of God's pure and unadulterated goodness. Now, the notion that evil transcends and at the same time co-opts in its service specific acts and behaviours of sinful human beings as a kind of a cosmic dynamic force, it's all, of, it's all the way through the Bible, of course, uh, and it's famously alluded to in that petition of the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Deliver us from evil. So that when the Apostle Paul speaks of the pervasive and destructive power of the flesh, for instance, he has in mind something much more than literal flesh and blood, as, if, as in the damage that can be inflicted by mere human beings, but something that is co-opted by a dark spiritual realm. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, he says in Ephesians chapter 6, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, in a, in a setting like this, I'll take it as a given that you know how the Bible speaks of these things, although it is probably true that the pervasive materialism of the West means that it's perhaps easier to pay lip service to this cosmic and demonic dimension without really giving it its proper due. But merely to pay lip service to this cosmic dimension when ad addressing the nature of violence and abuse is, from a biblical perspective, to underestimate its force severely. 
Now, the next thing to notice from the psalm are two dimensions to David's response, which, as we'll see, correspond to the, the nature and the dimensions of the threat. The first is the way that David calls upon the justice of God. And yes, a just design, divine response to this will certainly entail a proportionate punishment of the oppressor, verse 15. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead, likewise verse 23. It'll also involve disarming their weapons, verse 9. Lord, confuse the wicked, confound their words. There's undeniably a measure of anger and hurt in David's words, and I think Christians can struggle with these sort of imprecations. Aren't we supposed to turn the other cheek, to bless and not to curse, to forgive and our enemies? And yes, we are. All of those things are biblical injunctions. But the Bible is also very realistic about the need for justice to be done. Forgiveness and mercy must never come at the expense of justice. And to the extent that a debt of punishment remains outstanding, to the extent that justice has not yet been fully done, the emotion that fittingly corresponds to that lingering debt is anger. When Abel was murdered by his brother Cain, even the very ground on which his blood was spilt is rightly said to have screamed out for vengeance. The scriptures are realistic about human anger and the thirst for justice and in itself it's not an inappropriate or unreasonable thing. And the injunctions the Bible gives to, to the victim to extend mercy and forgiveness to their oppressors should never be accompanied with any shame that there is also an aching thirst for justice, vengeance even. This, I, I think, is vital for the pastor to be sensitive to as we witness abuse, along with the expectation that you might, perhaps even should, enter into some of that experience of that anger yourself. But notice what David does with it, and this, I think, is the critical thing. He, he turns it over to God. And this suggests a couple of things, I think. The first is more obvious than the second, but the second is equally important and perhaps more confronting. The first implication of what David does with his anger is this sense that injustice will never finally be resolved except in the hands of God. That's not to say there isn't a place for the rule of law, not at all, but according to the Bible, that lingering intuition that justice has not yet been fully done, even when the oppressor has been restrained or locked away is testament to, fact, to the fact that earthly measures of justice are only ever provisional at best. And when all is said and done, only God has the capacity to right the wrong. Why is that? Well, surely it's because we're compromised in our ability to see things with full clarity, either because of our own moral failures or more fundamentally, because our perspective is simply finite and limited and we will never be able to comprehend the full scale of the damage done, the cosmic forces it has unleashed or what is required to bring proper restitution. Only God in his holy purity and infinite wisdom has such a capacity, which means our own attempts at righting wrongs will always fall short or perhaps even lead to further distortion and injustice through overreach. Now don't, don't hear me wrong, I'm not, when it comes to violence, I'm not a principled pacifist. There is absolutely a place for a measure of earthly justice, together with legal enforcement, if necessary, both for the protection of the victim and for the restraint and punishment of the offender. I also think it's absolutely proper that when God's people witness abuse, that we should be at the front line of seeking that those measures are enacted and enforced. Because in the process, we're, all, we're also acting as witnesses to a God who will bring his own righteousness to bear. But what I do want to say, however, is that earthly justice, the rule of law, will never satiate the thirst for vengeance. Because it never can get quite to the heart of the injustice that has been done. And that leads, I think, to a second implication of David handing over his thirst 
wrathful vengeance to God, which is less obvious but perhaps more confronting. And that's the sense that David must hand over his anger to God, as if that is the only thing he can do. The unspoken implication in that statement is the or else. What happens if he doesn't? Will it consume him? It's not unreasonable to conclude that it will. Because you see, just as the crime itself can only be justly resolved by God, at least with absolute finality, so then the aching thirst for justice is a dynamic that will be too powerful for him, for any collection of human individuals or for any human institution to bear. And I take it that's why in the end the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Because ultimately only he can. Now as I've said, anger in the Bible isn't necessarily a problem in itself. It's a fitting and even necessary response to injustice. But the Bible also regards it as a highly volatile thing that very easily threatens our well-being. And thus to carry the burden of anger and to refuse to hand it over to God is to invite the possibility of being consumed by a dynamic that will quickly turn malevolent and destructive. Paul says in Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. It's not so much a proscription against anger itself, you see, so much as an exhortation to ensure that the sun doesn't go down on your anger. Why? He says, and this is telling, so as not to give the devil a foothold. In other words, the suggestion there is that not only might the acts of a violent aggressor be co-opted by the forces of darkness, by the powers of darkness, even the righteous instinct for justice is something that the evil one longs to seize to his advantage. And so Paul exhorts us to hand over our anger to God. Now, I think this is the more confronting of the two implications because it does suggest that the victims of violence and oppression are called upon by God to do something. They are called to be alert, to be attentive in a particular way or else to risk further harm and even greater alienation from what is good and from what will ultimately bring joy and peace and justice. In other words, there is a sense in which the agency and the personhood of the survivor has been damaged and bent, if you like, by the violence in a way that needs healing and liberation, lest those forces of darkness continue to threaten and disrupt their well-being and their wholeness. But to find that healing, what is implied in David's own response to violence is that there is a specific part for the survivor to play. The thing that they are called to is an act of trust, actually, an act of letting go, letting go of something, that thirst for final justice and entrusting it into the hands of God. Nonetheless, it is something in which the agency of the oppressed is fully involved, and that, I think, is something that is likely to be extraordinarily difficult, since the powers of darkness are arrayed against it. Anyone who has been through any significant form of abuse will tell you what it is, just what a battle it is to place their anger in the hands of God and to extend any form of forgiveness. It's a battle because the, the powers of darkness are arrayed against it. And we need to be honest about that. And of course, that's another point at which the pastor needs to be especially alert. To underestimate the immense difficulty a survivor is likely to face in exercising their agency in this way, perhaps for a very long time, perhaps maybe even the rest of their lives, is to run the risk of adding insult to injury, even to feed the evil, no matter how noble our intentions may be. I'm not going to say any more than that for for the moment because that's only one half of the act of trust we witness in David's response and without the other half, it is incomplete. See, it's one thing to turn over that thirst for vengeance, which will terminate in the punishment and disarmament, not just of the individual impressors, but also of the cosmic forces that they have unleashed 
But that act of trust does not yet receive back what has been lost. And until what has been lost has been restored, justice has not yet been done, has it? That lingering dilemma again points to the provisionality and ultimately the inadequacy of the rule of law. It's one thing to lock the murderer away. It's another thing to give back the one whose life has been stolen from her loved ones. But until that happens, there is a void which itself is a perpetuation of the evil and the injustice, even after the act and the aggressor have receded into the past. I first preached on this psalm nearly 20 years ago, just after the September 11 attacks. And I, I remember the president at the time speaking, you might remember this, speaking for the need for infinite justice. 20 years later, no surviving victim will tell you that anything like infinite justice has been done. So notice then the second dimension to David's response. Not only does he hand over his natural thirst for vengeance to God, but verse 16, he calls out to God for salvation. Verse 17, he hears my voice. Verse 18, he rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me. I mean, are you kidding? What an extraordinary thing for him to say. Then in verse 22, he says the same thing in the form of an exhortation, and it's rightly a famous exhortation too. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Clearly, David has in mind here something much more than a mere word or gesture of comfort and consolation, although that might be part of it. The expectation is far more extensive than that. It's the anticipation of comprehensive healing and restoration that, so that even perhaps the wounds themselves will be subsumed into an even greater and, importantly, indestructible joy. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Ultimately, of course, it is the death and resurrection of the one who has, as Isaiah puts it, taken up our pain, borne our suffering, that prevents David's words from falling into a puddle of cruel sentimentality. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's nothing sentimental about Christ's invitation because... He himself carried those very burdens all the way to Calvary, only to emerge in triumph over them three days later. And therefore, a bruised reed he will not break, a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged until he establishes justice on earth, Isaiah predicts. In other words, the psalm's implied call to hand vengeance over to God is accompanied with a promise that God will bring final justice for the victim. Infinite justice, we might say. In a form of comprehensive relief and healing from the damage done, not just from the oppressive, but much more significantly from the destructive, oppressive forces that have been unleashed. And so then, the other half of David's act of faith is to entrust himself to God for thoroughgoing healing and restoration from the harm that's been done. Now, just as entrusting our anger to God does not do away with the rule of law, so does the act of entrusting our healing to God not do away with specific measures that might bring important relief in the meantime. Specialist counselling, therapy, pastoral care and so on. All these things may well function as means of grace. But they are not substitutes for divine deliverance which will only really ultimately reach its completion in the age to come. And as before, there is an implied or else here that is confronting, I think. For without a posture of trust in the deliverance of God, the threat remains and will undoubtedly perpetuate itself. So what I hope is now apparent is that there is a particular posture in which God calls the survivor of abuse to exercise their agency. They are called to do something, and that is to trust him, 
you might think it's taken quite a long time to say something so obvious as to seem almost banal. But I hope that the psalm has been helpful in illustrating that it's quite a specific exercise of trust that is on view in the face of a threat that is more pervasive and more menacing and more enveloping than what the eye can see. And because of the nature of that threat, it will be a whole lot easier said than done. In fact, humanly speaking, nigh impossible without the strength that God himself has promised to provide by the power of his Holy Spirit. Which is why, pastors, once again, we need to be particularly sensitive to the spiritual dynamics at work. Yes, there is a way in which God is inviting the survivor to hand over that burden to him in trust. But that's not an invitation for the pastor to underestimate the scale of what that will involve by offering glib, free advice and pious platitudes which are only likely to make matters worse. The scale of what it will involve must surely drive us first to our knees, seeking the Lord's continual strength on behalf of the survivor, as well as seeking wisdom to know how to support the survivor with great alertness and with patient, ongoing commitment to their spiritual well-being. More than that, I think, there's even a sense in which the survivor's burden offers the pastor a unique insight into the nature of evil and thus a willingness and humility to listen and even to learn from the survivor's experiences of paramount importance as they seek to care for that person. Now, there's a whole lot more that could and probably should be said. But what I want to do in our remaining minutes is I want to spend some time trying to situate this dynamic in the context of the fall. Why do we live in a world like this, where the actions of others can have such a destructive impact on us, exceeding even the specific acts themselves? Twenty years ago, the English theologian Alistair McFadgen wrote an important book arguing that the dynamics of violence are too pervasive to be reduced to specific moral acts, but need to be thought of more like an enveloping system, a pathology that drives, that, that thrives on the agency of its perpetrators and its victims and binds them both in very different but destructive ways, without at the same time blurring in any way the vital distinction between a guilty perpetrator of violent behavior and an innocent victim of violent behavior. He wants to say that much, absolutely yes. But he is saying that to stop there is to underestimate what's really going on. And taking the case studies of child sexual abuse and the Holocaust, he argues that the evil dynamic at work in both these scenarios only makes sense in light of a notion of original sin, the sort that was famously defended by Augustine in the wake of the Pelagian controversy in the 5th century. It's a technical and tightly argued book which is informed by his own experience, not just as a theologian, but as a Samaritan counsellor and an advocate for victims of abuse. And it's notable, I think, that in his study, McFadgen casts a lengthy sideways glance to the way in which feminist theologians, luminaries like Mary Daly, Judith Plasco and Rosemary Radford Reuther, have for decades been arguing something strikingly analogous to the point that he's seeking to make about the nature of abuse. Each of those voices seek to speak of patriarchal oppression, of which they would most definitely regard domestic violence as one very concrete manifestation, as something much larger than the sum total of specific acts of oppression and larger than the male individuals or institutions that might encourage or commit those acts. Rather, they argue patriarchy, and whatever you think about patriarchy, this is the, the, the nature of their argument, that patriarchy needs to be seen as a pervasive system that binds the agency of men and women. In different ways, yes, but in a way where both the agency of men and women perpetuate its pathological force. And therefore, freedom for the female victims of patriarchy is to be found, they argue, not simply by exacting vengeance against their male oppressors, but through an awakened sensitivity 
to the binding effects of oppression. That kind of awakening will provide an opportunity for women to live in accord with an entirely different narrative, where male, where female identity and personhood can be healed and can flourish in the context of healthy relational systems. And as McFadgen points out, that much aligns entirely with the point that he draws out from the nature of sexual abuse and the Holocaust. What McFadgen wants to add, however, is that the binding effects of an evil pathology like patriarchy or any other sustained form of abuse should be properly thought of as sin to the extent that such an enslavement involves a misrelation to God, an orientation away from him as the dynamic, life-giving source of all that is good. Now, feminist theologians are nervous about the traditional definition of sin, not least because they think it reinforces precisely the very patriarchal dynamic that needs to be resisted. McFadgen, however, will carefully reply that it need not, provided you get your understanding of God right. And that is an important discussion for another day. So McFadgen's basic argument is that only an Augustinian understanding of original sin has the theological explanatory power to make sense of the sort of dynamics that are at work in abusive scenarios, the sort of dynamics we witness in the psalm. And I think he's right. So in our final minutes, I want to try and sketch an outline of how Adam's fall sheds light on the problem. An Augustinian will argue that Adam's fall from innocence and purity in the garden had a binding and polluting effect on the entire human family, specifically in connection with our agency, our wills, so that with Adam's fall, the human will is no longer free in the way that Adam's was free before the fall. It is now bound not bound in the sense that it is forcibly disabled and incapable of making real choices, but morally bound in an orientation away from God as the true and abundant source of all goodness. And Augustinian will want to say a couple of things about Adam's specific sin and its effects. The first is that there is a very important sense in which it was uniquely his sin a sin in which you and I had no part and for which he is uniquely guilty. You and I weren't personally there in the garden and therefore in a vital respect it's not our sin. And yet it is a sin that has dam damaged us all terribly in a terribly destructive way, in a way that we cannot escape its enslaving effects. The sort of effects that bind us all in the direction of perpetuating sin in our own lives. And I might be responsible and guilty for my own sin, yet I wouldn't be in this situation where I cannot but sin if Adam hadn't violated my will through his fall. Not only has he violated my will, but he has surrendered all of his descendants, the entire human family, to what the Apostle Paul calls a dominion of darkness in Colossians chapter 1. So that the enslavement of my will to a life of sin is now doubly bound to a spiritual force that is intent on making the most of my bondage and reaping as much havoc of the situation as he can. All because of Adam's sin. And when you think of it like that, hopefully it isn't difficult to see why theologians have long regarded Adam's sin to entail a violation of all ten commandments, of the entire moral law, not just in its vertical or Godward direction, the so-called first table of the law, but also in its horizontal dimension, a violation of the spiritual and physical well-being of all his neighbours, the second table of the law. And when the Bible presses us to think of the human race as a family as it does, it's not at all being clever to say that Adam's sin in the garden was an act of violence against his descendants, against his children, his family of a scale and proportion that is unique in its malevolent effects. There's nothing clever or novel about that claim from the perspective of the theological tradition. I've, on the outline, I've 
put a quotation of one how one old theologian describes this dimension of Adam's sin, Francis Turretin in the 17th century. Here in Adam's fall, as it were, there was a complicated disease and total aggregate of various acts, both internal and external, impinging on both tables of the law. Contempt of the divine word, ingratitude, pride, profanation of the divine name, transgressing the first table. But notice, so he also transgressed the second by want of affection towards his children. By homicide, precipitating himself and his children unto death. By intemperance, gluttony, theft, appropriation of another's property without their consent and so on. Now, this is why it needs to be said that from a biblical and theological perspective, there is a very real sense in which the evil dynamics of violence have already been unleashed on the entire human family in the way that every single human being is inescapably caught up in its effects. In other words, the scale of this evil is so comprehensive that it envelops the entire human family and it has bound us all in different ways to its evil. And what that means is that any specific act of violence of one of Adam's descendants against another occurs out of this situation where the aggressor's will has already been violated by Adam on the one hand and then on the other. It also means that the effect of those acts of aggression against their victims only serves to reinforce damage that has already been done to the violated wills of those victims. Now that is not at all to provide some perverse excuse for those specific instances of violence. And we have to be especially careful how we speak to this reality, lest it encourage some kind of perverse blame shifting. You know, like Adam in the garden, remember? Who engaged in the conceit of blaming his wife and blaming the serpent. No, no. But what it does do is shed light on the reason we're in the situation we're in. That is why the violent acts of another collaborate with and reinforce an evil that is far bigger and far more enveloping than those specific acts of specific individuals and why it threatens to torment its victims in ways that transcend those specific acts. And it's why we have to speak of domestic violence and other, all other forms of human oppression as an evil system that arises in the context of a human family that has already been torn apart by the treachery of its first parent. So that specific instances of domestic violence serve to reinforce the damage that has already been done as if to rub a great deal of salt into an existing wound. And it's a problem of such a scale that only a righteous God can solve and redeem us from. We can and we must create safe spaces and enact forms of mitigation to stop violence in its tracks and to bring a measure of justice. All that is the least we can do. But from a Christian perspective, it will never be enough because ultimately there is no safe place except in the arms of Jesus. Now, as I've been hinting at at various points, the nature and the scale of this evil also creates an obligation to a particular pastoral attentiveness too. An empathy that must begin with advocacy for survivors, a diligent application of various policies and practices that redress patterns of abuse and seek to protect survivors and promote their well-being. But it has to go further than that. On the one hand, it calls for an awareness of the way that we too, as children of Adam, have been swept up in this evil. We're not totally objective bystanders, you see. And as a result, we ought to expect that we might find ourselves readily collaborating with its destructive effects. That's why I said before that a pastor needs to be particularly sensitive to the spiritual warfare a, a survivor is likely to face and to have humility to learn from the unique insight of the, that their experience provides to the enveloping nature of evil. See, the instinct to cover up 
to excuse, to turn a blind eye, to downplay, to act insensitively, to demonstrate disinterest or neglect is part of the evil itself. And we must be attentive to the way that we as pastors and churches and Christian institutions can find ourselves collaborating with the powers of darkness. Whether in, intentionally, as too often has been the case, in, especially in the past, it can easily still be the case today, or whether even unintentionally, with insufficient attentiveness to the way that our words, however well-meaning, no matter how good our theology, might end up making matters worse, as I found myself even doing to my shame in the advertisement of this seminar. Indeed, we also should be aware of the way that the evil one will do his darndest to capitalise on our naivety and our carelessness, to ensure that what comes out of our mouths, no matter how well-intentioned, will do more harm than good. But in spite of the nature of these challenges, the nature of this dynamic nevertheless impels us to a particular kind of proactive pastoral response. One which, in dependence upon God, patiently, gently, but persistently seeks to help a survivor exercise their agency by entrusting themselves to Christ in a very specific way in the, in the face of a very specific situation that they are in. As difficult as that will prove to be because all the forces of darkness are at work against it, but not impossible, thanks be to God. And I want to say that safe ministry has to involve at least this even if it also needs to involve a whole lot else. Although, once again, we need to be conscious of the way in which the evil one will do all he can to undermine this vital ministry. And I should add, too, that the same underlying principle applies to the way we might minister to a perpetrator of a violence, a topic, a, a necessary topic for another day. But, of course, their failure to take accountability for their actions and their burden of guilt in a way that hands it over to God in full repentance and faith will likewise only perpetuate the evil. I mean, one only needs to think of Dostoevsky's crime and punishment to witness the tormenting effects of violence on a perpetrator if it's not properly addressed. An extraordinary exploration of that. Now, I forget, that was point two. Now, no, I beg your pardon, we're up to the second implication. Before I finish, I want to say something else about Adam's sin that makes it unique, actually, among all acts of violence. And I'm not going to say much about it, but it's important for us to note. The Bible always says that I am individually accountable for my own sin in a way that no other individual can be. And you, you see an, um, a whole chapter-length exploration of that principle in a place like Ezekiel chapter 18. And therefore, as we speak about specific acts of domestic violence, it's extremely important to uphold the specific guilt and accountability of the violent oppressor and the innocence of those who have suffered that oppression. We saw that in the psalm. David is innocent of those specific acts that have been inflicted on him. And to blur that line in any way, and in any way to hold the victim to account for the perpetrator's sin, even in a small way, is to perpetuate the evil by committing a moral outrage of its own. I cannot underline that more emphatically. Even though God might call me as a victim to exercise my agency in, a for, in the form of an act of trust in him, lest the damage perpetuate itself in my life. Yes, that's the accountability that God ascribes to me as a victim. I am accountable in that way and I will not find redemption and shalom from the effects of violence without it. But that's a very different thing from saying that I was in some way complicit in the particular sins of the aggressor, which I most emphatically was not. And undoubtedly, a significant part of our pastoral ministry may well be persuading a survivor to, the, to be attentive to the presence of shame, that tormenting fear that all this might be in some way their fault, as a lingering dimension of the violent dynamic itself part of the burden that needs to be handed over to God. And as I said, there's a sense in which recognising that I am not to blame 
applies not just to the sins which others commit against us, but also to the sin of Adam. His was a sin against me and against you, an act of violence in which you had no part. But the Bible makes one major exception to this principle, and it's in relation to this very Adamic sin. It, while everything that I've true is in one respect, as said, is true in one respect of Adam's sin, it's his sin, not mine, and yet it's violated me in untold ways. In other respects, the Bible says that God does count Adam's sin as mine in a way that he does not count the sin of any other individual as mine. In other words, so tight is our familial identity and our unity in Adam, and that's a very difficult thing for us as individualistic Westerners to get our heads around, but so tight is our familial oneness in Adam that God counts his sin as if it were mine. That's why we speak of an original sin, which in one respect is the sin of Adam alone, but which in another respect is a sin that has been ascribed to us all because of the tightness of our familial unity as human beings. And on that basis, there is a sense in which God will hold me to account personally for Adam's sin and its damaging effects in a way that he will never hold me to account for any other person's sin. And that's important to note. But it's just for noting, as it doesn't take away from the sense that Adam's sin was at the same time his own sin that has inflicted untold damage on his whole family and has spawned a host of evil and abusive systems like the specific instances and manifestations of domestic violence. But to end on a joyful note, the fact that God views the human family as such a tight unity so as to count the sin of its first parent to each of his children is the same reason why he considers our unity as God's redeemed and adopted children to be so tight that the one perfectly innocent and supremely righteous act of its head to redeem us from the mess that we're in might also be counted as our own. See, it's exactly the same. There's a very real and inalienable sense in which Christ's righteousness is his, not mine, even though it has brought untold redemptive blessings to all the members of his family. And yet at the same time, it is counted as mine and is my new identity. And that's the liberating reality to which violent people and the victims of their violence are called to, by God to entrust themselves.